Our speaker today is uh, Tom Pearson, and uh, many in this room know Tom from different perspectives. Some may know him as being active in the community, serving on boards involving food operations, aging, and health care. These interests have led the board to him serving in board roles in groups such as diverse as Midland Meals, Home Hospital, NCHS, and more recently as chair of Westminster Village Board. Some may know him as the university employee in a number of administrative and faculty roles, including positions and appointments in the Division of Housing and Food Services, the College of Education, the Division of Continuing Education, and numerous university-wide task forces, including Professor of Business Development and Director of Graduate Programs for the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Now, lastly, a few of you may know that he has actively served on food, hospital, health industries, and as an active advisor and consultant for over 30 years. And that includes bringing him to the topic for today, as he has had many projects in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan over the last 20 years. Uh, sponsors and clients, including the National Ministry of Tourism, two provincial governments, seven major hotel corporations, and five major universities. His topic is Chinese, China's new assertiveness. Tom Pearson. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with this group and enjoy your happy dollars and your singing. Yeah. In Rotary, we always sing one song. Yeah. You can't stand any more punishment than that. <laughs> <laughs> and our mark of success when we sing is if, if we get more or less to the end at the same time, it's a good thing. <laughs> but this group's got a lot of old friends, and I appreciate that. And, and of course, I want to include my much younger sister, Mary Alice. So uh, <laughs> that's an old joke, but she's an old, old friend and very valued. My topic today is Chinese assertiveness in Southeast Asia. You could go on and on and on about this. So I thought I would break it into sections for you a little bit um, and do two parts. One is to talk a little about um, what the Chinese are doing. Some of you may know bits and pieces of this. You may not know the extent of it. And more importantly, in the heart of this talk, is to talk about why. Now, you have to forgive me a little bit because our AV um, projection system and the computers didn't line up today and we're having a little trouble. So we pulled up something I think will help you a little bit. And this is a broad map, but it starts with, my story really starts with Africa. You may not know that the Chinese have made tremendous investments in Africa over the last 15 years. Half of the Chinese foreign aid goes to Africa mostly in the uh, areas of food and natural resources, uh, but their activity in Africa is twice what the United States puts into Africa. Twice. Uh, it is focused. It's very, very focused on things that will help them. If you look at the story uh, of China, you'll see very easily that a lot of China in the northwest section is very dry and arid and they cannot produce enough food to take care of themselves. That's a huge set of problems. And the answer is Africa. Now, if you're going to do that, and you also have a shortage of oil and other natural resources that you need to build this economy, somehow you're going to have to protect all of these investments. And the reason that we pull this one up, if you look down here, Madagascar, and Mauritius, 
are places that the Chinese have built huge port facilities. They're going to protect their investments in how this works. <coughs> they pulled a lot of money into another major port here in the Shetlands. Great idea. Gives them a good base to work from. You're going to skip this area, but the next, in you know, what we call the string of pearls, is right here at the corner of Iran and uh, Pakistan. Huge investments being made right there, including rail, pipelines, roads. It's a $46 billion investment that they just broke ground on within the last couple of months. They can take advantage of the oil from here, but not get wrapped into the mess in Iran and Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Then if you come around, the next shot stop on the string of pearls is way down here in Sri Lanka uh, at Colombo. Again, huge investments in a port facility and using it for a lot more than just their use. Now, this is becoming uh, a serious trade center for a lot of India. If you come up next, you can come up here and uh, we've got Bangladesh and we've got um, Burma or Myanmar, and both areas are designed to primarily for pipelines, but we're going to pipe oil and other resources from these ports into western China. Huge set of problems for them out there, and this is a nice, easy way to work it. One of the reasons for developing the string of pearls the way they have is this is a problem down here. This is the Strait of Malacca, and at the bottom is Singapore. The strait is a haven for pirates because a lot of Indonesia is built up of tiny little islands. It's high, very easy for pirates to, to disappear among the islands. So I looked it up just recently, and in one day there were three pirate attacks on major ships here uh, in the strait. Not unusual. <laughs> Singapore then becomes a huge blockade, if you like, for commercial travel. Uh, you've got a lot of traffic and not enough ability to really handle it all. And if you really want to have a fun evening sometime, uh, Singapore is made up of islands, as you know. And, and if you go out to one of the islands that's more or less dedicated to recreation and tourism, it's called Sentosa. And you can sit out on the, the edge of the water uh, in Sentosa and look out over the Singapore Harbor and you'll see dozens and dozens of ships turn on their night lights all at the same time. It's a spectacular sight, but you get this wonderful idea how complicated this whole shipping procedure is. Then if you come around Singapore and come back up this way, uh, the Chinese have taken the island of Hainan and uh, 25 years ago when I was working on that uh, project that was designed to be the Chinese Hawaii. Um, but when they started to develop the string of pearls really adequately, they converted half of the island to a port. Now you can really transfer things into China, not good port facilities down here. But if you come around a little further, you can get to Hong Kong. Uh, they've rebuilt the harbor there. And if you go a little further, you can go up to the port of Shanghai. And they've completely rebuilt all of that, and it's a massive, massive project. Think of the amount of money that's been put into this. Um, in addition to this, if you like, they tried to make friends with as many of these little island communities down in the South Indian uh, Ocean. Uh, and they're calling that the Silk, uh, the silk Road, if you like, uh, but it's the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, there's no great commercial value to any of this, but they want to make friends all the way along this pathway so that there is as few disruptions as possible in what they're trying to do. Uh, the next thing you want to do is say, we're trying to strengthen this whole area of western China. The Pakistani pipeline project is going to be really important to that whole thing. But even more important, if they can get it to work, they've always wanted to build a canal across the middle of Malaysia. That would skip Singapore and 
uh, make this whole thing much more efficient. They've been working on this for 20 plus years. They've never gotten the politics of it quite right, but that would be the master stroke if they can get it done. Um, we're doing this not just in Asia, but China's trying to project its image and its power other places. And some of you may have seen that just recently they announced the groundbreaking for a canal in Nicaragua. Uh, remember, back in 1900, there were uh, two alternatives to building a canal across Central America. One was in Panama, which we ultimately chose for a variety of reasons. But the better physical possibility was to do it across Nicaragua. But they never could get the politics right. Well, now you have a president that's for sale. Noriega will sell anything for enough money. He can sell it to his people as, as a great project, lots of jobs and other things. But the, the benefit goes to the Chinese. The Chinese don't do anything that is not to their advantage. In this case, they're trying to build great uh, trade relationships with both Brazil and uh, Peru. Uh, huge investments, working well for them, but it, it again, projects their uh, their interest. I'm sorry that the map we pulled up cannot do this, but there are two other things you may be aware of at this point. One is what they call the first island chain. The chain, I wish I had that, that part of the map, but the chain starts really at the southern tip of Japan. And it comes down along the east coast of Taiwan, skips along the coast of uh, the Philippines, a little bit of, of, along the coast of Indonesia, and then back up along this coast with Vietnam. Um, that's where they keep talking about all of these um, new islands that are being born along this chain of islands. There are rock outcrops all the way along that path. So anything that sticks out of the ground far enough, they've plowed over and put an airstrip on it, or a scientific mission strip on it of some kind. But they want to make sure that nobody else can claim this ground. Um, more interesting is uh, the second one. Um, there's something called the Nine Dash Line. And its line is very similar but it starts at the southern tip of Taiwan, follows pretty much the same pattern across down and around the Philippines and top of Indonesia and then back up. And that's the one that's got everybody excited because now they're claiming all of the rights to that body of water, especially fishing rights and, and natural resource rights. And the people here, especially Vietnam, are very, very concerned. fun to watch this. A lot of interesting <clears throat> players going back and forth, doing strange things. Uh, the Vietnamese have always been concerned about China. You know, we forget or never knew in this country that the, our war in Vietnam ended in 1975. 1978, 200,000 Chinese soldiers went across that border into Vietnam to punish them for what the, the Vietnamese had done in uh, some of the other countries here in the peninsula. That's a huge burden to carry historically. I get a real kick out of doing this because it's not only these physical things, but it's the things that um, we don't see very often. We've got now the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. That's all the countries in the northwest of China and they're trying to make a common market there. That even includes Russia. By the way, the Russians just sold huge amounts of oil to China at very, very favorable prices. Um, Chinese always win on these negotiations. Uh, it's fun to watch. But they're also building trade and finance organizations, trying to build alternatives to Wall Street, alternatives to the dollar, and alternatives to the World Bank. There's no accident here. This plan has been put together starting 30 years ago, and they simply chunk off bits and pieces of the plan. 
we have no idea what's happening or why, and we have had basically no fundamental response to any of this, um, except the opening to Asia that was announced a couple of years ago now. Um, in the middle of this, the Chinese have also always had the idea that you take advantage of unusual opportunities. So when the price of oil collapsed, uh, China started buying oil for their own reserves. Remember, they have very little of their own. So for the last year, year and a half, they've been buying at least 21 million barrels of oil a month and putting it in their stockpile. It's cheap. It's being given away. Why not take advantage of it? Um, I admire the plan. You, you can't help but admire the plan and how much progress they have made. But there are prices to pay with that. And in this talk, I make no apologies for the Chinese. They obviously have huge problems with corruption and, and legal issues and other things. My job today is just to explain what is happening and then to really get into the heart of why this is happening. But one thing I wanted to mention before I get into the why, um, some of these things are quite unsavory. There is no concern about local populations or pollution uh, unless there is a protest that gets mounted to get enough popular support. Um, Africa, all the deals in Africa exempt the Chinese from human rights obligations. All of them. Um, there are now 700 Chinese soldiers protecting one oil installation in South Sudan. Couldn't care less what happens to the area around them. The goal is to get the oil out of there and to get it back safe. The Pakistan deal with all of the things that are going to happen there is amazing. Pakistanis have promised 12,000 soldiers to protect the Chinese workers during this project. 12,000 people. That's two complete divisions. Uh, they're going to take that effort away from fighting the Taliban just to protect this Chinese project. Um, Chinese simply say Pakistan is a failed state. They, they, just, they just chalk it off as a failed state. Say, here's what we want to do, and here's how we're going to do it. Um, now let's talk about the why. What's going on here historically that have this whole thing make sense? The first thing I wanted to talk about briefly is a, a very unusual sense of time and order. Time is a, it, very different to the Chinese. And they believe that success, success as a society comes with a long period of time using the strengths of a strong central government. Historically, that strength came from the imperial system and the emperor. If you could simply get to the right people, in other words, to the emperor, you could solve all of your problems. But historically, their success was built around this system of the imperial idea. Remember, that imperial system is in place by 300 BC. Their history and their perspective is a lot different than ours. That first bureaucracy and the imperial system was based on tests and training and, a, and a, an education system that worked very well for them. Then if you add in Confucian, uh, the Confucian body of thought, which comes along about 500 BC, and add in Buddhism, that comes along about 100 AD, <laughs> and you put all of these things together, they all focus on a natural order and a respect for history, strength, and elders. <coughs> it ties together beautifully with what they've tried to do. And it changes time, because time now is measured in epochs, not years. Any order of progress is based on the collective society and again, individual rights are not important. And their legal system is bendable. <laughs> we don't like to talk about that, but they bend it all the time. Uh, 
second thing I wanted to share with you is a very different concept of history. And I'm going to skip a lot, but they believe they were the first of the best. And you'll hear references in China all the time to the Middle Kingdom. Okay. Heaven and earth and China. This is a society that feels it's always led the world. They had cities, collective living groups, 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago. With good grain storage and sewage systems, some of which have been rebuilt today for tourists, but it's amazing to see what was done then. By 500 AD, or 900 AD, the capitals of China had 25,000 foreigners living there for trade and diplomatic reasons. 900 AD. For reference, France had just formed, and there is no Germany yet. That's how far ahead they think they are. Here is a society that mapped and discovered much of the world, at least 200 years before Europe. By the mid-1300s, China had mastered latitude and longitude. And they had shared this knowledge. Columbus had a map of the Americans at least 20 years before he said. There was a good map of Australia 350 years before Cook ever got there. Magellan had a good map of South America before he ever discovered the Straits. We don't talk about any of those things in our history at all. Um, but it's built into their DNA. By the early 1400s, China has successfully recorded 2,000 years of history and knowledge. In their new forbidden city that was just completed about 1420, they had a library. That library had 11,000 books in it. 1400. We're just coming out of the Middle Ages in Europe. <laughs> And there are no libraries. The only library that's even remotely close to this quality would be the Islamic Library in Alexandria. We don't talk about that one either. No. Uh -huh. By this time, early 1400s, the Chinese are ready to explore the world and did so. The goal primarily was trade, but 1421, there's a book out by that title. You get a chance to read it, it's fascinating. They assembled a fleet of over 2,700 ships, probably in groups of about 100. The largest boats were over 400 feet long, length of a football field plus, 1,400. These were treasure ships. There were water ships, there were grain ships, there were fighting ships. They had some form of communication in them. The largest fleet was 300 vessels with 28,000 men. When they went around the world and began to map it even more extensively, they took with them cyclopedias and they either gave or sold them in the countries they visited. They had books on war, and tools, calendars, and some people will say that some of the early trips into the Mediterranean provided the seeds for the Renaissance. How many of you have ever heard that story? <laughs> the goal was to educate the barbarians, seek potential trade, and foster tribute. And by the mid-1400s, most European leaders were sending tribute to Beijing, including the Pope. Annual tribute. They mapped in these trips even more of the world, South America, North America, Australia, Africa, Southern Europe, and parts of America. We have DNA that evidence from the Indians now that show that the Chinese were active in Oregon, Rhode Island, Delaware, Massachusetts. How much of that was there in your eighth grade history class? <laughs> Interestingly enough, when they were all done, they got everybody back and said, we haven't found anything. There's nothing out there that's valuable. <coughs> so they closed off the country. They scuttled the ships. They sank all the ships. Just brought it back 
put information in the libraries, and the emperor is quoted by saying, we possess all things. I set no value on objects strange or ingenious and I have no use for your country's manufacturers. We would not establish equal diplomatic relations with anyone. This is the middle of the kingdom. For 350 years, that's the decision. It has implications for all of us. And maybe last year, they never had a consistent international friend or protector. They were humiliated by the British starting in 1842, by the U.S. and then by France. Even a rebellion within China was run, there was a section of China being run by the Christians for a little while in the mid-1800s. They were humiliated again by Great Britain in the late 1800s, especially with the formation of Hong Kong. They were humiliated by the Japanese starting in 1895, but that dispute between Japan and China really started when Japan started to modernize and the Chinese were being left out. So there was a competition there and it got hot and it got cold for a while and they traded educators for a while and they did interesting things. But off and on, China was being run by the Dowager Empress because the emperors were young or they died or they were too weak. And the Japanese routinely tried to assassinate her. That doesn't make for very good friendships long term. <laughs> they suffered massive losses in World War II, theoretically as, an, as a, an ally of the United States and Great Britain. 14 million dead, 80 million refugees. 14 million dead, remember. In both fronts, for the U.S. and World War II, we lost 400,000 people. China lost 300,000 people in five weeks just before World War II was really declared in the massacre at Nanjing. Five weeks. There are monuments there. That the interesting part, if you're going to work in China, is you better understand this history because they will expect you to understand this history. They expect you to understand yours, and they expect you to understand theirs. <laughs> uh, that's a very different approach from working in a lot of, of different places. Remember, in World War II, Great Britain simply wants to protect India. They couldn't care less about China. So they never supplied, the Allies never supplied China adequately at all. And they were never given the leadership that they valued. We have a hero called Joe Stillwell. Right? Led, the, led the protection of China. Chinese hated Stillwell. They knew that he didn't really care. Couldn't wait to get rid of him. But they will expect you to know about Stillwell because in, in some of their monument areas they'll have pictures of World War II. And one of the first tests they will give a Westerner is when you go in there, you better be able to recognize all the U.S. generals and military leaders, the Brits, and the Chinese. Um, it's an interesting test to watch. Having gone through it a few times, and thank goodness I knew most everybody, uh, then you step back and just watch them do the test with the next round of visitors to see what will happen. And last, of course, let's not forget, after World War II, they were humiliated again by the idea of Taiwan. They know they're strong and they're wealthy, but they do not yet feel admired as they think they should be. And last, they have a very different approach to planning. As I said, they're very short of materials, so they have the deals with Australia, Indonesia, South America, Canada, as well as Africa. They're short of water, so they've taken over the Tibetan plateau, and all the news here is about um, the problems with the Dalai Lama and the Buddhists. The reality is, they need the Tibetan plateau for the water. There are five major rivers that start on the Tibetan plateau, including the Mekong and the Yellow. You control the Mekong, you control all of this. Think about that. 
you really control the yellow, you can start siphoning it off. And as it comes out of the mountains and down, you see these huge pipeline projects to take water north. <coughs> massive, massive projects. And we see parts of that, as some of you have been on, uh, parts of the river systems in tour boats. And obviously, uh, they want to minimize the influence of the Japan, Japanese and the US. Functionally speaking, they don't respect the United States at all. They don't respect our forward policy. They don't respect our leaders. They think we don't make progress. Not like they make progress with a 30-year plan. Um, so one of the first things a wise man told me when I first went to China, this is 30-some years ago, don't ever go anywhere near the US Embassy. It will simply make you an object of suspicion. I work for the federal government of China. I was the safest guy in the world. I don't need the Chinese or you know, the US Embassy to do anything. So the best thing I can do is stay away. And it does help. It does help. Let's quit there. Can I answer any questions for you before? Yes. I understand they have no patent protection. So like the company I used to work for tried to develop new hybrids and we gave it up because we couldn't protect our germplasm. The question, right. question was about patent protection, and you're right. Remember, the legal system just bends to whatever's necessary, uh, especially if you talk about growing crops in arid ground. <laughs> they're they're going to take it. Um, used to, uh, Chinese always flew me first class. They spoiled me a lot. I, I, unbelievable spoiling. But you met really interesting people on the trips. And you, these are 24-hour trips in the early days to get where you're going. And I uh, had a, a manufacturer tell me one time he had great patents in, in all Europe and the United States. And he, he figured his patent was, his, his intellectual knowledge was good for six months in China at the most. And it would disappear. Yeah. Yes, sir. What are all the Chinese students doing here? For <laughs> ah, that's a good question. That's what are the Chinese students doing here at Purdue? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, this started uh, uh, really in the early 1980s. And it was, again, very systematically put together. Uh, the Chinese knew they had certain needs based on their priorities. Um, from my own perspective now, uh, they needed people who could put together a tourism industry. They needed uh, cash, U.S. dollars. And the fastest way to do that was to build hotels and do some things. But they had no hotels and they had no chains. They had no way to do this. Uh, so they started looking around for people in the US that had management experience and uh, background that might be able to help. So they contacted Purdue. They started sending chosen students uh, to, to Purdue uh, to work on PhDs, and they paid. Ideal for professors, all of you, you know. I, I didn't have to raise the money or anything. <laughs> they just came and they were well paid and they did our projects and we did all kinds of fun. The same thing happened in, in every discipline. So they started looking for engineering help, they started looking for ag help, and at Purdue that's kind of how it started. But, uh, uh, and beyond that, now you've got prestige that's gotten in the last few years, it's, it's more prestigious to get a U.S. degree in some ways. And so we've got these huge numbers of applicants that are here. That's a, that's a very short answer to a big question. Hey, look, we could spend lots of time with great questions. We can't. It's 1 o'clock. And let's give our speaker a shot. <laughs> Thank you. I had to do that. But uh, I think we've all learned something new about China today the aggressiveness of China today. Uh, when I was on a spring break vacation, I really hated the fact I missed Dave Bangert, the program that Roy Johnson lined up. And Roy had to back out. First thing I did when I came home was to get hold of Dave Bangert because I had a May program. He's coming next week. He, uh, uh, you just have to read his articles. Some of you disagree, some of you agree, some little, some more. Uh, but today, Bangor spoke for an hour and 15 minutes at Westminster a week ago, Monday, and it was just fantastic. 
he, he likes questions and answers. So my program topic is Q&A with Dave Bangert next week.